Welcome to the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on circular and satellite motion. The topic of this video is the apple, the moon, and universal gravitation. And we want to know how did Isaac Newton develop the law of universal gravitation and what is meant by saying that gravity is universal. I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. Nearly every child knows the word gravity. Gravity is the reason the spilled milk falls off the breakfast room table. It's the reason our first bicycle ride had as its grand finale a fall to the concrete pavement. It's the reason what goes up must come down when we're jumping on that backyard trampoline. The fact is that gravity is that thing in our minds that cause objects to fall to earth. But in physics, we have to explain phenomena in terms of their underlying principles. And those principles that we use must be big enough and universal enough to explain a large collection of phenomena in a very consistent manner. What we need is a more sophisticated model of gravity than what goes up must fall back down to Earth. We need a model of gravity that is universal and large. And in this video, and the two that follow, that's what we'll attempt to build. This is the circular and satellite motion unit, and by the time a student of physics gets to this unit, they've typically had a unit on kinematics and Newton's laws, and thus they've learned a thing or two about gravity. For instance, they've learned that gravity is the force that acts between the Earth and objects that are on or near it. They've learned that for the force of gravity is also known as the weight and can be calculated by taking the mass of the object in kilograms and multiplying by 9.8 newtons per kilogram. They've learned that when acting alone, gravity causes a special acceleration known as the acceleration of gravity. And they've learned that this value for the acceleration of gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared on Earth and is independent of the mass of the object. Now, all these things are true. But they only beg some questions, like what's the cause of gravity? Is it like magnetic? And what variables affect its value? And is the force of gravity that pulls me to Earth the same force that pulls the Earth towards the sun? And can we ever escape the force of gravity? How far does it stretch? These are questions that we'll begin to answer as we build our big universal model of gravity. In the early 1600s, mathematician Johannes Kepler derived the three laws of planetary motion. The laws were descriptive in nature, describing in detail how the planets moved about the sun. But they never offered any explanation for why the planets moved the way that they did. For Newton, the man of three laws, the idea of a description of motion without any explanation was indeed bothersome and this sent him on a decades-long search for the underlying principles that, that explain the motion of planets orbiting the Sun, and even more bothersome, the motion of the Moon orbiting the Earth. For Newton, he knew that the Moon was moving in circular motion, and because it was, it had an acceleration. And for him, accelerations required some form of unbalanced force. What was the force that would cause the moon to deviate from its otherwise straight line inertial path? Isaac Newton postulated that the moon was a projectile, an object upon which the only force is gravity. His thoughts in this were published in the hallmark book, The Principia, and included the diagram you see above. In his writings, he suggested what has come to be known as the Newton's Mountain Thought Experiment or the Newton's Cannon Thought Experiment. Imagine a very, very tall mountain from the surface of the Earth whose tip was above the atmosphere, so high that any object launched from it would be free from air resistance. Imagine a high-speed cannon that would launch a cannonball horizontally tangent to the Earth at high speeds. What would happen to the cannonball? Because of the presence of gravity, one could expect the cannonball to fall below its otherwise inertial straight line path and eventually land on the Earth. But if one fired the cannonball a little faster, it would still fall to Earth, but travel further before it finally landed on Earth. One could imagine a speed at which you'd fire the cannonball, such that instead of falling into the Earth, it would fall towards the Earth but never change its height above the surface of the Earth. For an object launched from Newton's mountain, that speed would be 8,000 meters per second. Such a cannonball would continually be pulled towards the Earth by the force of gravity, but never fall into the Earth because the rate at which it fell would match the curvature of the Earth. For Newton, the moon is like the cannonball. 
that falls relative to its straight line inertial path, but it falls around the Earth instead of into the Earth. And everybody knows that the cannonball is like the apple, for the force of gravity acts upon objects that are on or near the surface of the Earth. So if the moon is like the cannonball, it's also like the apple that free falls from the tree to the Earth. Now all of a sudden, gravity is universal. It extends from the Earth to the moon and from the sun to the planets. Gravity is universal. Now science is empirical, which means it's supported by evidence. So Newton's challenge is to provide reasonable evidence for how you can believe that the force of gravity can be extended from the Earth where the apple is to the moon, which is 60 times further away from Earth's center. Here's the values known in the day. The acceleration of the apple was 9.8 meters per second squared, and the acceleration of the moon was 0 0.00272 meters per second squared. Somehow gravity is being diluted by the distance that the moon is from the Earth, that the further distance makes the effects of gravity much less. What's the relationship? Well, it's not obvious to everybody what the relationship is. But then again, Newton isn't anybody. Newton looks at the numbers and realizes that the acceleration of the apple is 60 squared times larger than the acceleration of the, of the moon. 60 squared or 3600 times larger. Well, what's that have to do with all this? Well, now, if you look at the distance from the center of the Earth to the location of the apple, it's one radius of Earth. And if you look at the distance from the center of the Earth to the location of the moon, it's 60 times further. It's 60 Earth radii. And there you have it. It's the inverse square law relationship. The idea is that gravity does become diluted by distance in such a manner that the force of gravity is inversely proportional to the distance an object is from the center of the Earth. The inverse square law is at the heart of Newton's argument that the force that causes the apple to free fall into the Earth is the same force that causes the moon to free fall around the Earth. The inverse square law suggests that the force of gravity and the accelerations which they cause is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the two attracting objects. When you look at the acceleration of the apple compared to that of the moon, the ratio is 3600 to 1. And that ratio is the inverse square of the ratio of the distances between the center of the earth and the moon in the center of the earth and the apple. 3600 is the magic number in Newton's argument. The law of falling bodies on earth is the same law that governs the motion of heavenly bodies such as the planets, the moon, and orbiting satellites. It's the law of gravity as a universal force, no longer restricted to large mass objects like the earth acting upon small objects that are on or near its surface, but instead applying to all objects throughout the universe. Universal gravitation asserts that all objects with mass attract one another. Newton did not discover gravity. He's far too late for that. Instead, Newton discovered that gravity was universal, that it applies to all objects on Earth, off the Earth, of big mass, of small mass. And by employing the idea of universal gravitation, Newton was able to explain the century-old mystery of why planets orbit in the way that they do. It's at this time in every video that I like to help you out with an action plan, a series of next steps for making the learning stick. But before I help you out, could I ask you to help us out by giving us a like, subscribing to the channel, or leaving a question or comment in the comments section below. Now for your action plan. Here are four resources that you'll find on our website. I've left links to each of them in the description section of this video. You have a concept builder and a Minds on Physics mission which provide immediate feedback to questions and a help me button that leads to question specific help. You have a simulation that allows you to change a variable and observe the effect upon the system. And finally, a written tutorial page that's a great refresher to this video. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H. Thank you for watching.